just want to say thank you all for, for coming down tonight. Um, I really appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about you know, what TJ and I, um, you know, what our attempts are at helping prevent as many injuries in you, as you, in you guys as possible. You know, we want to do more of this, which is always part of the plan, was to kind of come together every now and again and just kind of talk about the issues that we face as a community, as, you know, sports, um, you know, athletes and, uh, and sports medicine people. You know, it's not a one-sided thing. So this is a difficult subject, injury prevention. And when I TJ and I kind of started talking about like what we would do or what, what topic I would do. And it's like, oh yeah, we'll just do an injury prevention talk. And then as I kind of got into it, I realized how loaded a topic that really is because there's not really any singular aspect of injury prevention. You know, I like this imagery because it's like a very daunting, like getting over the hump of a baseball because With throwing injuries, they're on the rise. They're not falling. They are every year, we're seeing more and more and more young guys like yourselves suffering from elbow and shoulder injuries to, to the point where it's an epidemic, right? So, you know, same thing with female ACL is an epidemic. Low back pain is an epidemic. And we're really not putting a dent in this. Why is that happening? There's a, well, there's a lot of reasons why. Obviously, participation is up across the board. You know, 20 years ago, there was no, you know, travel leagues and, 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 and showcase leagues and all of these other teams that you guys have an ava the availability to play, which is awesome, you know? Um, so that's great that more kids are being able to play baseball, but with that, the numbers are just gonna to continue to go up. And kids that might not have been able to play baseball years and years ago because they didn't make the team or for whatever reason, those guys are now playing and they're getting hurt. And we need to know why that is, okay? Um, you know, year round participation. This year's major leaguers, like today's major leaguers, are really the first generation of guys that played year round baseball, just like you guys are doing. So we say, oh my God, you know, in the 60s, we didn't see these Tommy John injuries like we're seeing now. Why is that? Well, you know, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of those guys were multi-sport athletes. They didn't play baseball year round. They played football in the fall, they played basketball in the winter, and then they played a few months of baseball, right? So they had the opportunity to kind of develop in other ways, whereas you guys are hitting it hard at a younger age and, and that mileage is accumulating on your body. Um, you know, same thing, early specialization. You know, guys are becoming, pitchers at eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, and they're saying, I'm a pitcher, which is great, but there, there's, there's some problems with that when it comes from a developmental standpoint, and we're gonna talk about that tonight too. Okay, so again, injury prevention assumes that you're healthy to start with, but do we know that? Do we know just because you're not in pain doesn't necessarily mean you're 100% healthy and ready to play. So, you know, we assume you pass your physical, you're good to go all as well, but that's not necessarily the case. And, that, and I want to kind of expose a little bit of that tonight. And then I'm hoping a lot of you athletes that are here that are our guys will start to see the reasons behind we do certain things. The reason behind why Coach Kyle drills movements a certain way, the way we teach certain movements in the weight room. They're, everything here is for a reason. There's a thought process behind it. Uh, it's not just let's bang weights around for an hour and get you sore and sweaty and send you on your way. We're doing everything in here for a reason, okay? Right, so again, injuries on the rise. This is from uh, the Andrews Sports Medicine Institute. This, is, this last year is 2010, but that's a staggering number. The numbers in red are the numbers of youth athletes, adolescent athletes, under, right? So obviously they do the most um, Tommy Johns and shoulder and baseball specific surgeries in the country. So that's why I pulled this data from them because you can see that trend. And that's only from 94 to 2010. That's a really short window of time, right? So that's a sobering statistic right there that we're not putting a dent in this, okay? You know, so the first step really is the way you solve any problem. We wanna look at, we have to identify it. We have to put our finger on it and say, this is the issue, let's start to address it. Okay, but this issue is tough because it's, there's a lot of factors that go into this, right? You know, and, and the answer that you get about this is gonna change depending on who you talk to, right? You talk to your coach, he's gonna say, hey, you know what, you didn't do your off-season work. You talk to a nutritionist, they're gonna say, oh, your nutrition's poor. You talk to a physical therapist, they're gonna blame your insurance company for not paying for more visits for you to go to physical therapy. You talk to, you know, you talk to your parents, they're blaming the coach. So we're all not, not on the same page. We all have something to contribute to the solution, but we all need to talk about what the problem is first in order to get there. So okay. we gotta look at this modern youth sports culture from a philosophical standpoint. And this is like a hot topic for a lot of people and I've talked to parents and I've talked to coaches individually about this and you know, it's a sore spot because your coaches, they wanna just, they wanna win, 
but they also want to, you know, see you guys playing on their teams in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, and they're really just trying to help you guys. It's not, it's not that they're bad people, it's that they're just trying to help, you know, and they're trying to give you everything that you need in order to play baseball, right? So we put a lot of emphasis on acquiring the skill. Okay, let me throw this curveball, let me throw this slider. Okay, great. We put so much importance on skill acquisition of being able to play the game, put the bat on the ball. And again, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And youth sports teach us a lot about ourselves, teaches us how to lose, teaches us how to be a good team, teammate, a good sportsman, okay? So there's a lot of positive things that you gain from playing sports. You know, you guys are all playing on travel teams and you have your winter workouts and don't worry, your coaches are gonna do a strength component. They're gonna do an injury prevention program. But I gotta be honest with you, your coaches really don't know. They're working outside their scope. You know, they're not rehab professionals, they're not athletic trainers, they're not certified strength and conditioning specialists. Again, they're not bad people, they're trying to satisfy a need for you guys. You guys need this, and they're trying to give it to you as quickly, easily, and inexpensively as possible. But that's not always the best way. And obviously you guys are all here for a similar reason, okay? Um, unfortunately, you guys with the most talent at a young age, you're the guys that are the most at risk because you're playing those positions that require the highest level of competency for your age group in terms of throwing, hitting, fielding, whatever the position may be, whatever the sport may be. So you guys are getting used, you're playing pitcher, you're shortstop, you're center field, you're third base, right? So you're throwing a lot, okay? And that, so the younger you are, kind of the more at risk you really become, okay? You know, prevention, right? We talk about the term prevention, we're doing it in other industries and we're doing a pretty good job at it. Thing, look at the you auto know. industry, you lease a car, Right, that lease comes with maintenance, scheduled maintenance. Why do you think it comes with scheduled maintenance? Because those automakers know that if they give it to you, the cost for them is negligible compared to maintaining that vehicle and getting it back in good shape so they can resell it later. Right, if the car comes back and it's wrecked after two years of a lease, the engine's shot because you didn't change your oil, they can't sell that car, right? So they give it to you knowing that they're gonna make their money back on the back end anyway. Right? So we're right. doing it in other industries, but we're not doing it in orthopedics, right? Our orthopedic system is reactive, it's not proactive. We wait till you feel pain and then you go to the doctor. Okay. We work backwards. We wait till it hurts and then we go and try to find why it hurts. We try to find the cause after the fact. And the problem with that is imaging, right? You get it, what's the first step? X-ray, X-ray is clear, great, awesome get the MRI, and the MRI is always where people get really hung up, okay? Again, MRIs are a diagnostic test, they have their value, of course they do. If you have structural damage, we need to know about that, but why do you have structural damage? Just because something's torn or frayed or inflamed is not telling us the reason why it is that way, it's just telling it, us that it is, okay? So that's not solving really a problem for us, okay? You know, and, and if you guys were all healthy, you know, we can't just MRI you before you're hurt and say, okay, let, let's look at this before they get hurt. A, that would be way too expensive, and B, we would find a lot of false positives, okay? I can guarantee you, if I MRI'd everybody in this room right now, we would probably be horrified by what we saw. Horrified, but you guys all managed to be just fine, right? Some of you guys have structural issues, bad MRIs. There's a few of you sitting in the room right now. Bad MRIs, no pain. You're able to play your sport at a high level, no problem. But other people is not the case, right? So how do we find the source of an injury before it happens? That's the hardest part about this topic. So really the next part is identifying the risk factors. A really good quote from the Art of War, Sun Tzu, every battle is won before it's ever fought. Okay, obviously this is a little bit out of context, but you know, you guys are putting in the time right now and that's the difference in, in the whole injury prevention game. We're gonna get into a little bit of why this is happening, right? So what's the number one predictor of an injury? Does anybody know? Anybody? The number one predictor of an injury. It's a previous injury, right? It's the easiest answer. If you've been hurt, statistically speaking, if you go to a doctor for an injury, statistically speaking, you are at the highest risk to go back. That's on me. That's on healthcare, right? So this is a problem so what are we doing wrong that if you get hurt, you go to the doctor and you've been through the system, we've diagnosed you, we've maybe done a surgery or an injection or whatever we're gonna do from a medical standpoint right then and there and you've gone through the rehab process, shouldn't you be fully rehabilitated and, and, and normal again? again? What we do is we wait until the pain is gone and then we stop. 
As soon as you guys are pain free, out the door you go. And you go right back to your sport and the job is not done. Okay, but just because you're asymptomatic doesn't mean you're functional or fully functional, okay? But asymptomatic does not mean functional, right? So your elbow starts hurting. What's the first thing you guys do? Oh, throw a bag of ice on it. Numb up the pain. You know, that, that ice ain't helping you get better. I'm gonna tell you that right now. In fact, do you guys see an ice machine here? I've, I've probably worked on almost all of you at some point or another. You've seen me in recovery lab for an injury, a pain, a strain, you know, something feels tight, whatever it may be. Have I ever iced you? No. Because it's just covering up the symptoms. Same thing with the Advil. Some people think ibuprofen is breakfast food. You know, I'll just pop Advil all day, every day. And so what is functional? Is it performance metrics? We do performance evaluations too to see, you know, to prove to you guys and your parents that are paying for this that the training is working. Okay, so is that what functional is? Is it skill mastery? Because you can throw 80 miles an hour at 13 years old, is that what function is? I don't know. So we go back to does it look athletic, right? Timing, control, precision, fluidity. You watch some of these guys in the major leagues, NFL, NHL, it's fluid, it's smooth, right? They look athletic. But can you be high performance but low functioning? What do you guys think? That's RG3. Kyle used this example too. High, high performance athlete, this is the NFL combine. Very low functioning, right? His body is compensating by collapsing those knees and if you don't have the stability from your musculoskeletal system, he's gonna use his MCL as stability, as a backup system. So you tell me. Um, so joint compromised athletes versus load compromised athletes. Joint compromised means you've torn a ligament, you've had an injury, right? That the, so what happens is now you enter the healthcare system, you get your injury fixed, now you're a load compromised athlete. If you have a movement dysfunction, you're a load compromised athlete. Doesn't mean you, can, you can't play, it just means you have to prepare yourself in a very specific way. Okay. The number two predictor of injuries is asymmetry and motor control, right? Motor control is a fancy way to say stability, okay? So again, we expect to see asymmetries in baseball. It's an asymmetrical sport, obviously. But there are certain things in your posture, in the way you move, right, that are, that are indicators or biomarkers of a faulty movement that can cause an injury later down the line. That's what we're looking for, right? So these things relate to posture and movement, and this is why we do this evaluation. Every time we, we do the FMS with you guys or we're doing a, the evaluation before you start training is we're looking for these signs that an injury is on the horizon even though it's never presented itself with an issue, okay? So this is the whole hardware, software thing. Right, your hardware, your physical body, your muscles, your bones, your ligaments, your tendon, that's your hardware. But the software runs the show. Right, your nervous system, your brain is running the show. Okay, so what we wanna see is that brain-body connection and that is really kind of the missing link for a lot of people. Right, we rehab the local you know, kinesiology but we don't necessarily rehab the whole person. Right, your insurance company is paying for, if you have Tommy John, they're paying to get your elbow out of pain, they don't necessarily care if you can throw a baseball or not. You don't have to be an athletic trainer, a strength coach, have a degree in movement science to see the best athletes on the field. We, we know, and everybody can see that, right? And, and the, the hard part for you guys, for you younger guys, is you're growing up in an age where technology has kind of made everything so much more accessible, but what it's also done is create what I like to call the belly button black hole, right? Everything gets sucked down towards your, towards your belly button. Okay, and here's the, here's the reality is we're the most dominant species on this planet, you know, not because we're the smartest, but because we adapt better than any other species. We compensate better than any other species. And it doesn't take generations for us to create these adaptations. We can do it in months, right? Has anybody caught that Mars special on National Geographic? Okay, they're doing NASA, they're, they're planning missions to Mars. Problem with Mars is it's so far away. Right, it takes seven months to get there. So they're doing manned space flights right now to see what it does to the human body to be in space in zero gravity for seven months. You know what happens in six months of being in space? Your bones demineralize by 20%. Right, because you're not using them. You're not load bearing. So it's, the, it's conservation of energy. Right, we can just leach all these minerals out of your bones because it's easier than getting it from food. It's already in your body, right? They're, these astronauts, their motor control is going through the pits that's happening in months, right? So imagine if you guys are sitting at a desk all day every day, right? You're sitting in school, right? You're looking at a computer screen, you go home, you're playing video games, right? Your body is adapting to that posture. 
And that posture doesn't mix with baseball. Sorry, just doesn't. You know what I mean? It's oil and water. You know, you're, you're demanding one thing from your body in the classroom and then a completely opposite set of things on the field. That's part of what we need to address, okay? Does this guy look like he's gonna throw a baseball pretty well? Shoulder internally rotated, shortened pec muscles, weak upper back. Reduced hip flexion, does this sound familiar? You guys do hip flexor stretches, we have you guys working on your upper back, right? We have you work on your posture. There's a reason for that. Not because we want you to look good, obviously we want you to look good, right? So, Gray Cook, founder of Functional Movement Systems, this is somebody who's been doing this a lot longer than me, and you know, he would, I would call him probably a mentor for all of us in this room right now. TJ's FMS certified, Kyle's FMS certified, that's that functional movement screen that we do, you guys. And what this is, you know, so what he's kind of proposed is this joint by joint approach, right? How does a human body work? We're a series of stable segments on mobile joints, right? So my feet are stable, my ankles are mobile, my knee is stable, my hip is mobile, my lower back is stable, my upper back is mobile, stable, mobile, stable, mobile. See how that pattern exists in the body? It exists that way for a reason, okay? So this concept is called regional interdependence. How does one area of your body influence and impact another area of your body? Right, so just because you got elbow pain doesn't mean that that's the problem. Right, that's just where you're feeling the pain. That's your body's way of letting you know, hey, guess what? James, something's up. So we got something going on that this elbow's getting stressed out. So we go back to that software concept, okay? Everything is related. You have tension receptors in your body. You have receptors in your joints that measure angle, velocity, tension, all of these things. And your nervous system makes an instantaneous reaction to that. Right, so when you're on the field and you see that stimulus, there's a reason Kyle plays these games with you. Why he's giving you a visual stimulus and having you react to it. He's trying to tighten up that response time. He's, he's stimulating your software. At that point, it has nothing to do with your hardware anymore. He wants to make you guys react faster with a more appropriate motor response, okay? Mobility is input, okay? So we're gonna go back to this computer concept, input, output, right? So all of your range of motion in your body is giving your brain and your nervous system input. So we know that over the course of a baseball season, a baseball player's ability to upwardly rotate their shoulder blade and get to this, up, this overhead posture diminishes as the season progresses. Right? So what happens is now they're losing some of that input. So now your body is making decisions with less information. And what it's gonna do is gonna start to compensate. It's gonna, it's gonna start to make up for that lack of mobility in other ways, okay? The easiest way for your body to get stable, you guys have shoulder issues, you've heard that instability, instability, instability. You go to the doctor, oh, it's unstable. Okay, that's just the symptom, that's not the cause. Why is it unstable? Right? The easiest way to get there is take away mobility. Your nervous system will literally lock your joints up to protect you. This is another great cook saying that I love. When pain is present, motor control, which is stability, guys, remember stability, is inconsistent and unpredictable. So, you know, doing more of what you're doing, when pain's not, I'm just gonna push through it. That, those days are over. No pain, no gain is BS. If you're in pain, your brain cannot learn. It will shut that down. You're in survival mode now, okay? Your body is desperately trying to tell you that something's wrong. And a lot of times, right now in the current medical model, we ignore it. We just try to treat the pain, okay? Pain is just the messenger. Pain is just the messenger. We don't kill the messenger. It's blasphemy. It's absolute blasphemy. <laughs> so the key takeaways for this section is injury risk has multiple factors, right? Human beings are very highly adaptable so these adaptations can occur or maladaptations can occur in very little time, okay? Our increasingly sedentary lifestyles do not mix with sports, okay? There's a reason why this place exists and didn't exist 20 years ago. You guys need this now. 20 years ago, we didn't need it, so it didn't exist. But now there's a need in the market and this is our solution. This is what we're bringing to the table to try to stem the tide, okay? Identifying biomarkers like posture and movement efficiency are part of the solution. If we can predict, then not necessarily that you will get hurt, but that you could get hurt if these things continue, we can at least address them in some kind of systematic way. It won't get better on its own. If it hurts, your system is already compromised. It's like thirst. By the time you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated, right? We all know that. 
Okay. Success isn't owned, it's leased, and rent is due every day. Listen, injury prevention is hard freaking work. It takes a lot of consistency, it takes dedication. It's not an easy thing, there's no quick fix. They don't exist. And if that's what you're looking for, then you're in the wrong place, or you're playing the wrong sport, okay? So what are we looking for? So this is like the base equation for an injury. And, I, and anybody who's been evaluated by me has probably heard this at some point, right? So it's a postural asymmetry, plus a movement dysfunction, plus X. X is specific to you. It's your injury history, it's the sports you play, the positions you play, it's these other variables that we have to account for before we can really evaluate you, right? And then you add repetitive stress to that equation, and that's the chronic overuse, nagging injuries that you're getting, right? These wear and tear type injuries. It is really easy to say, oh, it hurts when you throw? Just don't throw. That's just taking away the stress. But what happens when you put the stress back into that equation is that you have the same problem just pop back up. It may be not right away, but as soon as you get back to throwing again, oh, elbow starts hurting again, shoulder starts hurting again, right? Because all you've done is eliminate the independent variable, right? We need to, we need to start finding these independent variables and addressing them. So here's kind of the evolution of the evaluation that you guys go through today. TJ had a very specific evaluation that he did for his athletes before him and I reconvened, and I had a very different evaluation that I was doing with my athletes. And then we kind of put them side by side and went, hmm, do you think your evaluation could be better if I added mine to it and vice versa? We're like, well, yeah, right? Because it's like a filter, just like the Brita filter you guys have in your fridge at home. It's got stages, right? We're looking for the big stuff first. And then as we get down the filter, we're filtering out the finer and finer and finer things, right? So the first thing we do is injury history, right? We're looking at the other injuries that you've had in your career or in your, in your sport that, are lead, that might give us a clue as to what the cause may be. And there's lots of different causes for the same injuries, guys. It's not just one thing. Functional movement screen, the FMS. Okay, we do this FMS to kind of, as a macro level view, to see how you're moving globally. How does everything work together? How does all the joints and muscles play nice together? Or if they do at all, okay? And, and what we're trying to do is identify movement flaws. And here's another kind of sobering statistic. TJ and I talked about this today. And we said, how, how many athletes do you think we've evaluated since we started? What percentage since we started had a fail on the movement screen? Meaning zero is painful, one is a fail, two is a pass, but you're compensating, and three is perfect. How many do you think had a one or a zero? And the number is like more than 75%. Almost every kid we evaluate has a one on their, on their movement screen. That's a faulty movement pattern. That is a predicator of injury, right? But all of you guys passed the physical, you all went to your doctor at the beginning of the year and he did your reflexes, he might have done some blood work, he measured your height and weight and said, you got the okay, go play baseball. But 75% of you, maybe more, I didn't really get a chance to go through and look at them, but probably more than that had a faulty movement pattern because we don't look at movement when you're sitting on the doctor's table. If he, even if he flexes your leg up on the table to see your flexibility, there's no weight on your body. So how do you get a real true marker of movement if you're sitting on a table in a gravity eliminated position? Right, stage three is the orthopedic screen. I put you on the table and I move your joints around. So now I have this information from the FMS. Okay, their deep squat wasn't great. Their lunge wasn't great. Why is that? Now I'm starting to look at this orthopedic screen with a little bit more focus, right? I'm looking at your hip mobility, your ankle mobility, right? As possible causes for those poor movement screens. Stage four, the postural screen, right? Your default setting. Your posture is the resting balance of your body, where your body wants to be. Those are the length tension relationships manifesting themselves in your physical presence, right? That's what your posture is. And the last thing we do is the performance eval, okay? We go through all these things. We wanna see where you are today because we can't predict a point B for you if we don't know where we are right now. And we also wanna to prove to you guys that you're getting better. We get parents all the time. I can't believe my son's posture. I, I, it's unbelievable, you guys said it would change, but it's only been a couple of months, and it's remarkable. Well, you know, if you apply the right kind of stress, your body's gonna change, right? That's the whole purpose of this. So this is the performance pyramid. Most of you guys have seen this before too. This is how we construct high performance athletes, okay? At the bottom of the pyramid, mobility, right? We've talked about this already a little bit. Mobility is what are your joints capable of? If I took everything else away, no muscles, what, from a range of motion perspective, can that joint do? 
okay? The other part of the base of your foundation is your stability, right? Which is two things. A, your body's ability to control or maintain the congruency of a joint through range of motion, but also to resist an outside force. So it's kind of two things. So when you get on top of that, we build strength. And for you younger guys, these are the only three things that you really need to worry about. Right, so once you're moving, you have good mobility, good stability, your movement patterns are there. Once we turn all those ones into twos on the FMS, now we can start to strengthen and condition you, okay? On top of that, we build power. On top of that, we build speed. And at the very, very tippy top is skill, right? So, but what do we do? We start playing baseball, we go get our pitching lessons, we go get our hitting lessons, and we put all the emphasis on the skill. Skill acquisition and we put that at the bottom of the pyramid. Does that look really stable? Absolutely not, right? And then we go, what's the next thing you guys want? So we talk to, you guys, we talk to athletes all the time. What are your goals? What do you want to get out of this equation? What do you want to get out of this process? And the top two answers we get are, I want to be a better, insert your sport here, athlete. So I want to be a better baseball player, and I want to be faster, and I want to throw harder. We want speed and we want skill. Those are the things that we want, okay? But it is a long climb to the top before those two things can happen. There's a lot of work that has to get done, and that's the part that we're ignoring. Right? Years ago, it used to be you played all these different sports. We had gym class every day. You were learning all of these athletic skills and then getting good at baseball. But we don't do that anymore, and that's part of the reason why we're getting hurt. So we'll talk a little bit about mobility and the kinetic chain. Right? When you have a mobile joint, like I told you, right? your, your ankles, your hips, your upper back, your thoracic spine, your glenohumeral joint, your wrist, these are joints that like a lot of movement or they have a lot of movement, okay? But if you have a mobility deficit, you're gonna sacrifice some stability somewhere else in your body to get that movement. For example, my hip is all locked up, right? I, I can't move it as much as it should move. So what happens? That stress is gonna go somewhere, right? If you're pitching and you land on that front side leg and you can't rotate, you can't internally rotate on your hip. That stress is just gonna either go down to the knee or it's gonna jump up to your lower back. And your body's gonna leech that, that mobility somewhere else from a stable segment. And it's gonna sacrifice some structure to get that done, okay? You're gonna have disc issues, you're gonna shred up your MCL in your knee, right? If we're talking about the upper extremity, your, your upper back is tight, we see that all the time, right? Because you guys sit like this all the time and then you can't rotate, you can't create any separation between your hips and your shoulders. Right now, this doesn't move. Your shoulder blade now has to compensate for that. Right, so what does it do? Your brain just inhibits the musculature around it. It wings up. Right now, it's not a stable platform for your glenohumeral joint anymore, right? Your shoulder joint. And it's just on a floppy foundation. So what happens there? Now, this joint starts to tighten up. It feels tight. My shoulder feels tight. And what ends up happening is now you gotta get more mobility out of your elbow. And so we, what does your body do? It just uses that UCL as some stability, but that's not what it's meant to do. Yes, it holds the bones together, but it is not the primary stabilizer of your elbow. Throwing and regional interdependence. Okay, well guys, what is pitching? What is throwing? From a physics standpoint, it's generating force from the ground, transmitting it through your body, and delivering it to the baseball. That's what throwing is, okay? So our mobility and our mobile joints is the way we're able to kind of reduce some of that stress as it gets up to your hand, all right? Stable segments like your lumbar spine, your shoulder blade, and your elbow take that extra stress when you don't have the right mobility. So again, your elbow hurts, but is it an elbow problem? Or is it, you know, is it a problem somewhere else, right? Mechanics isn't enough, so what happens? Oh, you know, my elbow hurts when I throw. Let me go to my pitching coach and work on my mechanics. Right, so all you've done is now you're piling more skill on top of crappy movement. That's all you're doing. You're not fixing the problem, right? You're already in pain, which we already talked about. Now your motor learning, your body's ability to download a file and say, this is the movement we want to do when we throw a fastball in. Right, that's cachet, that's in your brain. Rob Cruz talked about it the other week. You have that movement memory, muscle memory. We've all heard that term before, right? But when you're in pain, that's out the window. Inconsistent, unpredictable. Mechanics isn't enough. Your body actually starts to adapt to the stress of throwing. Bony adaptations. Your shoulder socket, over time, will start to retrovert. It starts to actually turn backwards from the stress. Your humerus starts to torque itself, 
right? Which gives us the appearance that you have way more external rotation or way less internal rotation. And you go to the doctor and you say, you know, my shoulder hurts, and he measures your internal rotation and goes, wow, that's real short. You have GERD, you have glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. Do the sleeper stretch. But what he's not accounting for, did he measure your external rotation? Did he even measure the other side to compare it? We're looking for total arc, guys. You know, I didn't play baseball, I played lacrosse. But I've been an athlete my whole life. So I've thrown a lot of balls, okay? I have more external rotation on my throwing side and subsequently I have less internal rotation. But that total arc is the same, which means from a musculoskeletal standpoint, it's the same amount of movement. It just looks different because I have an asymmetry now because my bones have changed, right? And you guys have thrown at an even younger age while your growth plates are still open, this is happening at an accelerated rate. Stability, okay, that's the other part of the bottom of that pyramid, right? Stability and strength are not the same thing. We always confuse that. Shoulder hurts, coach says, ah, just do some external rotation bands, internal rotation bands, strengthen your rotator cuff. Your rotator cuff's not gonna get more stable because you did some isolated strengthening exercises. I'm not saying that those exercises aren't good, we do them here all the time. But we do them for a very different reason. Stability is reflexive, right? It's a response. It's a quick response. It's a quick correction, okay? Some muscle groups are stabilizers and some muscle groups are movers, right? Your rotator cuff is a stabilizing muscle group. It's very small. It's very close to the joint itself. And its job is to hold the head of the humerus in the socket. In whatever position your arm is in, that's its job, is maintaining the ball in the socket, right? And then your bigger muscles, your pec, your lat, right, your deltoid, these bigger muscles are the gross motor movers. These are the ones that move your arm through space, right? So what happens is now that rotator cuff isn't as responsive and these bigger muscles try to do the work and they're not good at it. They're really crappy at it, in fact. Okay, so this is uh, me and Sam. You know, we were working on some stability stuff. So what I'm doing is changing my pressure, right, and making her respond to it. She doesn't know what's happening because I'm doing it randomly. I'm not cranking on her. But her job is to maintain that position. My job is to change the stress and have her adapt to it. And the more you do that, the tighter and the quicker that happens, right? It's what we do in optimal arm projects. It's the reason you guys do the body blade and these manual resistance patterns, right? These are the things that we're doing to stabilize your shoulder, not just strengthen it. So what happens when your stress demand exceeds your capacity? And this is a big problem in sports too. Just because you can play doesn't mean you're ready to play, right? So as the season progresses, Right, you've trained all off season, your work capacity is nice and high, and then as the season progresses and you're not training, that work capacity starts to go down. But the demand of the sport continues to rise, and where those two meet is where you're gonna get hurt. And these things aren't linear like this, I just made this graph like this so that, to illustrate a point, is when your demand exceeds your capacity, you will get hurt. It's, a matter, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Okay. So your soft tissues are smart, okay? Your muscles, your tendons, your ligaments, they're very, very smart. They don't like to be stressed in inappropriate ways, right? So what'll happen is if you don't have stability in a joint, your soft tissues, your muscles will create it by just tightening up. You go, oh man, I, I always feel tight. I don't know why I always feel tight. I stretch it and it just keeps feeling tight. Well, why? Because your body wants to create some stability. It wants to feel protected, okay? Those trigger points, those knots, that tightness, that's what we're talking about. Let's talk about like regular brakes on your car versus parking brakes, right? Regular brakes, you can slam on them, you can tap them gently, you can pump them, right? You got a lot of control with that regular brake. Your, your, your secondary brake, right? Your parking brake, whether it's a pedal or, you know, in the console, you got a few clicks, but that thing's pretty much all or nothing. It doesn't work very well. So you don't wanna drive around town with just your parking brake, right? but a lot of you guys are. You're, you're throwing and you're playing sports with just your parking brake, and what, right? When your body doesn't have the ability to control it, it just slams on the parking brakes. So we're gonna do a little thing. I want everybody in the room right now to kinda feel around on the inside part of your elbow, okay? Like just below your UCL, you guys know where it is, in your forearm flexors. If you can snap over some stuff, if it feels hard, right? It should feel like chicken breast, uncooked chicken breast. Soft, supple, it should be smooth. If you're snapping over it, it feels like guitar strings, you're at risk. You already have your parking brakes on. Your body's already trying to create stability when there's none to be had, okay? So now we're gonna get into kind of some of the meat and potatoes, right, the, the, the way we do this. So what I'm gonna ask you guys and pose you a question, what would, I, what would you say if I were to tell you, hey, listen, we're gonna come in the gym every day and we're gonna do one rep max deadlifting every day that we're here? 
you'd all be like, no, your parents would not sign you up here. We would be closed, boarded up, chased out of town. Okay? We're not max deadlifting every day, but you guys get on the mound and throw hard every time you get on the mound. Every pitch. It's the same thing. Max effort, repeated, it's going to create some damage, guys. A, a little bit of a review. The fastest way to get hurt is to exceed your own capacity. Knowing where that line is is important for every athlete. Okay? So either you must, your activity either has to come in below your current capacity or we got to raise your ceiling. That's why we do the carries. We put you in a good position and we make you walk with it. Stabilize your joints. Build your ceiling. Raise your ceiling. That's why you do training and conditioning. We're trying to raise the bar so that as you increase your level of sport, your capacity is matching that. Rob Cruz last week, or two weeks ago rather, said at each age level up, there's less and less good kids, less and less good kids, less and less good kids. And he's talking about it from a skill perspective. But what I heard was there's less good compensators, there's less good compensators, there's less good compensators. Right, an elite athlete, why are they different from you or me? It's because they compensate better than we do, okay? They can adapt faster and better than we do. Right? The mileage concept. You guys have all heard me talk about this too. Throwing is like mileage on a car. You never take it away. You can only add to it. Okay? There are plenty of good miles out there, highway miles, but the city miles like you guys do in weekend tournaments, multiple games a week, I'm pitching two, three, four days a week. Every time you throw, you're stressing your body and you're doing damage every time. And when you accumulate enough damage over time, that's when you're gonna have some injuries, right? So improper dosing is one way to get hurt. And that's something we can change. We can, we can start understanding our bodies and how much we can tolerate now and address that. Save some of those miles for when they matter, okay? Dysfunctional movement, poor nutrition, poor recovery, poor training, all of those just accelerate the, the time that it takes to increase that mileage, just accelerates it. So the whole corrective exercise concept, really any exercise can be corrective, it just depends on why you're doing it, right? So we have to evaluate you, find that functional deficit, and then create a strategy or drills to address it, right? So first we wanna restore lost range of motion, limited range of motion, then we want to stabilize that new range of motion, we gotta teach your brain what to do with all that extra mobility, because it doesn't know, that's why if you guys have ever stretched out a tight area and then the next day it's just tight again because you didn't teach your body how to use it so your nervous system is not going to let you use it until you own it okay and the last thing we're going to do is load you we're going to reload you we're going to condition that better movement now so that it becomes downloaded in your brain okay this is my new movement system this is my new strategy for throwing this baseball in a better position upper cross syndrome right your neck is forward your shoulders are forward Right? So what happens is you have a series of tight muscles and overactive muscles and muscles that your nervous system is shutting down to allow this to happen. Right? So if we can understand that, then we can understand what we're trying to do from a corrective exercise standpoint is we want to kind of tone down those overtight muscles, whether we're foam rolling or using a lacrosse ball or you see me in the recovery lab and I'm doing manual therapy with you. Right? These are ways to inhibit tight muscles and reset them so that we can teach them new movement. Okay. Then we lengthen them, right? Then we're gonna do a little bit of stretching, right? Open them up a bit. Then we're gonna activate them, right? Isolation, your corrective exercise program, we're isolating problem movements to teach you guys how to use your new mobility. And then we condition you. Then we go in the weight room and we work on big movement patterns, deadlift, squat, landmine press, row, all these bigger movements. Okay. The manual therapy part is a reset, right? It's resetting that brain-body connection. When I work on you and you're real tight, and then over time, it loosens up. I didn't change your tissue. I didn't change the length of your muscle physically. All I did was I, I kind of whispered to your nervous system, hey, relax, I got this. We're okay. We can tone down a little bit. And what that gives us is an opportunity. It gives us a window that we can relearn how to use that muscle or that, that group of muscles in a more appropriate way. Okay, so treatment as a means of prevention. It's the same thing we go back to that you got high blood pressure, you take blood pressure medication. We don't wait till you have a heart attack, right? We take that blood pressure medication now. So it's treatment as a prevention measure. Why can't we do that, right? Because you didn't get a prescription from your doctor to go to physical therapy because you're not hurt. That's why Recovery Lab exists. It's access. Before, I used to have to get a prescription in order to do something for you guys. Now I don't have to. 
Now your parents just pay me to address these things now, before they're an issue. So thank you, Adam. He's here tonight. He let me kind of go pro a little session that we did. So a couple quick clips of me working on, you know, we're trying to work on his posture, right, to get his shoulder blades to sit back a little bit more, to give him a better position to throw from. So here I'm releasing his pec. He's got really tight pecs. We need to address that. So instead of him doing it on the ball, my fingers are a lot more specific because I can feel where you're tight too, right? The foam roller doesn't feel where you're tight. You feel it, okay? And I can adjust the amount of pressure, right? My evaluation tool is the same thing as the treatment tool, right? You don't go and get an MRI and that fixes your UCL, right? Then you gotta go to a, a person to do that. So that's what we're doing, right? I'm addressing these issues, allowing some blood flow, bringing some blood flow to the table and giving him an optimal healing environment. And he's not hurt right now. We're trying to prevent this stuff from happening. Okay. Right? The reason I do the Graston technique, same thing. With the metal instruments, we're creating blood flow. I'm applying a stress to your body and your body's gonna respond to it. Just like in the weight room, the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand, putting a demand on your system, and at a cellular level, your body's gonna start to orient those fibers all in the same direction. That gives you tensile strength. Right, so this is performance enhancement, just like the weight room is performance enhancement. Right, if you know what you're looking for, we can be very, very specific. Right here, I'm kind of strumming over his UCL, right, because when you have repeated microtrauma, the collagen fibers in your ligaments starts to get real brittle. Right, and but just by stimulating that little bit of blood flow and strumming that instrument over his ligament, I'm stimulating those collagen producers to lay down more type one collagen fiber, the really strong stuff. So we're making his tissues more resilient to change. And the last thing we're gonna talk about is just active recovery tactics, okay? The way you recover is gonna dictate your performance the next day, okay? So again, some of the older guys, let me kind of videotape them on the Mark Pro. The reason I like the Mark Pro is it's easy to use, it's over the counter, okay? We're activating fast switch muscle fibers, right? So the stim unit's providing the energy. I'm not treating your pain. That's what most stim units do, is they're just treating your pain. This is actually activating the fast switch muscle fibers in your body and creating blood flow. I've turned your arm into a pump, and we're just pumping the good stuff in and the bad stuff out. Right, Chris Tessitore on the Normatec. Intermittent compression, same idea. Your body knows what to do. These are just ways that we can augment the process. Notice there's no ice in this, right? So that series, that pump is just creating blood flow. It's creating blood flow, it's aiding in the lymphatic return and the venous return and getting rid of all that waste that piles up in your muscles from a lot of activity. Other factors, okay? Adequate sleep, right? Adequate nutrition, right? Our food isn't the best anymore. You know, our soils are depleted. I'm not gonna get into that right now, but supplementation, this is supplementation, what you're seeing right here. We supplement nutritionally, but AMP, the training that you guys do throughout the year is supplementing the fact that you don't really get enough stimulus in the rest of your life anymore. The key to this is access and early intervention, just like any other industry. The sooner we can find a biomarker for an issue, the sooner that we can address it. Let's address it now. You're gonna do the work either way. You, can, you really have two options. You can do the work now and dedicate yourselves. If baseball is what you love and that's what you wanna do, that's great. But dedicate yourself to the process. That's why we kind of preach in-season training because we don't want to see those numbers go down and then you dip below a functional capacity and you get hurt. Whereas if you're here, even on a one or two nights a week basis, at least we can see, you know, we can see, hey, you know, have you noticed that, you know, John is favoring his right leg a little bit. Okay, let me ask him about that. Or you can wait till you get hurt and then have surgery and then, and then go to physical therapy and rehab and then do it after. You're gonna put the work in either way. We would rather do it now. TJ would rather do it now, I'd rather do it now. You know, I don't, do 10 people in recovery lab on a Wednesday because it's great for me. You know, most of those people aren't hurt. We're doing the work now. It's gonna get done either way. So success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. It's a mindset, guys, it's a mindset. All right, so I just wanna say thank you again for honoring me by letting me talk to you tonight. I appreciate that. If you guys have any questions, any questions, please let us know, ask us, we're always here. You can ask TJ's wife, my fiance, we're here most of the time. So call, text us, email us. If you have a question you're not sure, just ask. And we'll do our best to answer. And if we don't have the answer, we'll find the person who does. Okay? Thank you. Appreciate it, guys.